The Honorable David C. Onley was appointed Ontario's 28th Lieutenant Governor following a distinguished career as a broad broadcaster. His honor has championed disability issues for many years and served as chair of the Government of Ontario's Accessibility Standards Advisory Council. As the first Ontario Lieutenant Governor with a physical disability, his honor has adopted accessibility as the overarching theme of his mandate. He has defined ac accessibility as that which enables people to achieve their full potential and believes that true accessibility occurs when disabled people can fully participate in the social, cultural, and economic life of Ontario. Because accessibility includes equal access to opportunities like education, his honor is expanding the Aboriginal youth literacy programs to include computer literacy. He's also the Colonel of the 25th Field Ambulance. He is the recipient of the Rick Hansen Award of Excellence. And, uh, I'm sorry, uh, and he has and received 11 honorary degrees. When I told someone today that I was introducing the left tenant governor of Ontario, they asked me why would left-handed people need a governor? That's, that was the joke that didn't go so well. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Honorable David C. Onley, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. Thank you very much, Noble. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, mesdames and messieurs. Je suis ravi d'être ici aujourd'hui. I'm delighted to be here today. It's wonderful to see uh, familiar faces in the audience and uh, to have met uh, new uh, people that I have not met before. Uh, it's always great when my brother Richard is here, the Vice President of Finance at Nipissing University, who does my taxes. And um, <laughs> so far, I'm still not in jail. So. <laughs> um, my son Robert and his friend Natasha are here as well, and this is always uh, great to see. And um, uh, my friend Ken Fredine uh, from Deloitte, who was the chair of the federal panel uh, assessing uh, disability in the workplace in terms of career and job opportunities. And Ken, it's uh, great to have you here. And uh, actually, I'll be touching on uh, the federal report at least briefly in my remarks. And it's also great that uh, during the introduction, it was read that uh, I was a uh, member of the provincial government's Ex Accessibility Advisory Council uh, in terms of the Accessibility Act, and one of my colleagues from that original council is here today, and that is Yuta Trevoranis from OCAD University with her uh, colleagues, and uh, what a remarkable, yes, please applaud OCAD. Uh, what a, a remarkable job, and uh, uh, treasure that OCAD is insofar as Toronto and Ontario is concerned, uh, really leading the way in some very, very creative initiatives related to accessibility. And so um, as I prepare to leave office sometime in 2014, I hope I'm going to be able in a more public way be, to be able to uh, bang the OCAD drum because it certainly is uh, deserving of uh, uh, greater awareness on the part of the uh, general public. Uh, I'm also very privileged to have found myself at the head table today with uh, such distinguished guests as were introduced a few moments ago, and I do look forward to the presentation of this year's Empire Club Community Service Award. A wise person once said, it is good to have an end to journey toward, but it is the journey that matters in the end. Uh, that's particularly a pertinent quote for me because sometime in the next number of months, my journey as Lieutenant Governor of Ontario will come to an end. And in the time-worn way of travelers nearing their destination, I find myself looking back on what has been a long and eventful road since my installation in 2007. And one of the first major addresses I gave as Lieutenant Governor was in fact at this dinner in 2007. In particular, I've been able to reflect on many extraordinary and transformative events uh, and on the people that Ruth Ann and I have met who in the line of the theme of this year's luncheon have put the human back in humanitarianism. Now first and foremost among these is of course Her Majesty the Queen 
and, and you probably would expect me to say that given my role as her representative in the province, but many years before such a possibility even existed, because nobody ever wakes up one morning, turns to their wife or their husband or spouse and simply says, you know, honey, um, I think someday I'd like to be Lieutenant Governor. You know, that, that's just not part of the uh, career plan equation for the vast majority of, peer, of people. But my first memory of the Queen goes back to her visit in 1959 to Toronto, where a group of young children, uh, boys in particular, were in wheelchairs at Kew Beach, and the late Con Smythe, who at that time was leading the charge along with Harold Ballard and uh, Bob Rumble to create what would become the Ontario Crippled Children's Centre a few years later and eventually would uh, morph into the fine institution that we have today, Blue Review Kids. But he was accompanying the Queen on her walk and it was a blisteringly humid 89 Fahrenheit degrees and even down at Kew Beach it was unbelievably hot in fact, I recall quite vividly, while the Mounties stood and not one of them keeled over, um, a, a U.S. Marine, uh, unfortunately, uh, keeled over. But my grandfather, who was British, felt that, that well, you know, you can imagine what he thought. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but he had insisted that since I was to be reviewed by the Queen, and I didn't understand that I was being reviewed, uh, he insisted that I be properly attired. And so I was wearing a dark wool blazer. I think it may have also been a wool shirt, may have been wool underwear for all I recall. <laughs> it was very, very hot. And all the other children were quite sensibly dressed in short sleeve cotton open neck shirts. And when the queen came on her walkabout, uh, the photographers of the Globe and Mail, the Star and the Telegram all happened to snap a picture within split seconds of each other and you can guess who was the one kid that stood out on the front page of the Star, the Telegram, and the Globe. You got it, the Queen. <laughs> so that became a definitive picture in our family's um, collection over the years. Um, and some five decades later, of course, um, I certainly realized that I had had that first little brush with Her Majesty. Um, and I discovered why the other boys and myself were there in the first place. I'd never really thought that one through. Why was the Queen reviewing a group of what were then called crippled kids? The Queen, as you see, was the first public figure to bring people with disabilities into the foreground during her walkabouts. Obviously, and clearly, and some of you may have memories of this, her father, King George VI, laid the seeds for this practice uh, during the Second World War when he used to visit wounded veterans who were out in public view at the hospitals and the nursing homes. But it was Her Majesty who built on this initiative by including not just wounded veterans, but anyone who had a disability. Right near the beginning of my term, we had a visit with uh, Prince Edward, the Earl of Wessex, and I brought along that picture from the Toronto Star, and I showed it to him, and I thought he would get a bit of a chuckle out of it. But it was intriguing to me that instead of particularly smiling or laughing, he immediately turned it to a fairly serious issue when he said, I recall asking my mother as a young boy, why do we do this? Why are there people in wheelchairs and crutches in the front row when you do your walkabouts? The queen then said to him, or as he said, and my mother said to me, uh, because I want everyone to see that those who live with disabilities are people too. And it was quite something a couple of years later when the Queen had the official visit here to Toronto in 2010 that we were able to spend a brief time talking about that very policy and that very process uh, that she began. And I thanked her for it as being the forerunner in terms of awareness related to disability. And she was gracious in her acceptance of that praise. Throughout her long reign, therefore, I think this is just yet another way of understanding and seeing clearly that the Queen has adapted to the times, uh, granting patronage to many hundreds of charitable projects and initiatives. Her children have followed her example and her grandchildren are doing so now, many of them becoming involved in a hands-on way that she cannot. The Prince of Wales charitable activities are so numerous that they were eventually brought together as the Prince's Charities Canada here, and I'm sure 
as uh, Matthew Rowe will attest, His Royal Highness has taken a personal interest in every one of them. Uh, his youngest son, Prince Harry, like a dashing young prince of legend, sometimes takes the concept of hands-on a little bit too far, perhaps, but, um, uh, but in the most positive sense, this week, for instance, he's braving the perils of uh, record low temperatures in the Antarctic to draw attention to the plight of wounded soldiers. Uh, when we say record, we mean all-time planet Earth conditions like on Mars records that were set this past week. Her Majesty's precedent, though, has also been followed by her representatives here in Canada at both the federal and provincial level. And when I became, when I became Lieutenant Governor, I had the examples of those who had preceded me to inspire me. Each had set their own stamp on the office, humanizing the relatively rigid protocol and procedural requirements of the vice-regal roles in their own ways. For example, one of my recent predecessors, the late Honorable Lincoln Alexander, made youth and education the key areas of his term of office. Um, the Honorable Hal Jackman's focus was on the arts, history, and national unity. And since leaving office, he has continued his support of the arts and, like his brother Eric, who is with us here today, is a generous benefactor of the University of Toronto. My immediate predecessor, the Honorable James Bartleman, advanced many causes, especially that of Aboriginal youth. Uh, Mrs. Hillary Weston uh, advanced the cause of volunteerism. And when Mr. Bartleman took office as the first Aboriginal to be a Lieutenant Governor, it, he was appalled by the third world conditions of First Nation reserves in Ontario's for, far north. And because of that, implemented a series of Aboriginal youth literacy initiatives that were touched on very briefly in my introduction. So when I became the Queen's representative, one of the first things I had to determine was the focus of my term of office. Now, in fact, I had known from the outset that it was going to be in terms of accessibility uh, because I was certainly aware that I would become the first Lieutenant Governor with a physical disability. But I wanted to be as encompassing as I possibly could. And so I adopted the concept of accessibility as the theme, as opposed to disability rights, which is a bygone term and it, in fact was first enunciated by another Lieutenant Governor, John Black Air, the one who preceded uh, Lincoln Alexander. And so I came up with a definition. Uh, of accessibility as that which enables people to achieve their full potential. And the reason I came up with that definition is that I wanted people to see that accessibility was about far more than just things like automatic do doors, curb cuts, and this wonderful and accessible ramp that has enabled me to take the scooter up onto the podium here. I wanted them to see that it was much more than that. I wanted them to see that it was a matter of people achieving their full potential. That is why during my term as Lieutenant Governor, I've been involved in a number of areas that transcend politics and speak to the Canadian respect for inclusiveness above and beyond the issues of accessibility to include advancing, advancing literacy among young Aboriginal people, hosting forums at the Lieutenant Governor's suite for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginals alike as a follow-through to the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions chaired by Justice Sinclair to build bridges towards understanding and growing reconciliation. And in the past year, we have had five such roundtables at the Lieutenant Governor's Suite, leading to all sorts of new relationships between people in the South and people in the North, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, perhaps one of the most exciting ones being a linkage between the Kobo ebook reader people uh, and other advocates of Aboriginal issues in Toronto, leading to the distribution of 3,500 fully loaded Kobo readers to young teenage Aboriginals here in the city of Toronto. Thank you. And overall, the other goal that I'd set out to achieve was enhancing the relevance of the Crown in the lives of Ontarians through links between my office and community events and anniversaries and linking us with several different organizations, not the least of which was beginning conversations with Amanda Sherrington and her colleagues at the Prince's Charities Canada 
wherein so many of the projects of Prince Charles here in Canada overlap and are complementary to the projects of the Lieutenant Governor. And I'm pleased to say that over the last couple of years, we have formed a strong and growing alliance. But while I promote accessibility in all of its forms, I've been especially troubled by one key area. And that is the obstacles that prevent people with disabilities from achieving their full potential. And specifically, the attitudinal barriers that keep disabled people out of the workforce. And now I'm going to give a plug for Ken Fredine. <laughs> because Ken was the chair of the federal panel. And after I've given you some of the information, you may want to be, and I'll ask Ken to stand so everyone can see who he is. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Ken. Um, because if you're wanting to take personal action in terms of your company or corporation or your uh, charitable uh, organization, after I've given you some information, Ken is one of the people to speak to in order to tell you how it is done. And failing that, if he's, the lineup is too long for Ken, and I hope it is, um, please feel free to contact me at the Lieutenant Governor's office. Let me give you some statistics that are unshakable, and that is that during the worst year of the Great Depression, the national unemployment rate reached an unthinkable 24%. Put this in perspective in terms of the downturn of 2008 and the recession that uh, occurred. We were never anywhere close to that number, and that was the bottom of the Great Depression. Yet today, the unemployment rate for people with disabilities who are educated, able, and willing to work is over 25%. And this does not include those who have given up looking or have settled for much lower paying part-time or contract jobs. And when they are included, the unemployment rate hovers around the 50% mark, 50%. And so for people with disabilities, it is not a great depression. It is a perpetual depression. It just hasn't changed. Notwithstanding the ramps, notwithstanding the curb cuts, notwithstanding the automatic doors, notwithstanding the work of all sorts of dedicated groups. And the main cause remains the belief in a series of myths about people with disabilities as employers, which is why I have taken this as my main topic. Now, one of the studies, in fact, that disproved the myths was done by Deloitte. Another was done by Compass Research. Both of them completely separate, a year apart, using different parameters, reaching out to different groups, yet the common denominator was speaking to employers who did and did not hire people with disabilities. And of those who did not hire people with disabilities, the common concept was they felt that they couldn't justify the hiring of a person with disabilities because the absenteeism rate would be higher, and the job retention rate would be lower, and there was a far greater chance of WSIB claims, injuries on the job. The surveys also and roundtables talked to people, employers, who do hire people with disabilities. And what they found to be the case was the exact opposite. That in point of fact, the job retention rate was higher, oftentimes much higher. That the absenteeism rate was lower amongst the lowest. And that the WSIB claims were insignificant in comparison to able-bodied employees. Now this applies to, and this was a part of the federal report, as the federal panel went across the country and talked to employers who hire people with disabilities to get the life stories, to flesh out the statistics. So we turned to a, a gentleman who's a friend of mine, uh, Mark Wafer, who owns not one, not two, but seven Tim Hortons outlets. He's a very wealthy man. I asked him once, in fact, that I always say with the seven Tim Hortons outlets, he's probably seven times smarter than pretty much anybody in the room. Um, I asked him how he made his millions of dollars, and he said, one cup of coffee at a time. <laughs> but Mark Wafer, over the last 15 years, has hired a series of disabled people, a whole range of disabilities, from invisible conditions to physical problems, and not just in starter positions, not just in the... Uh, the lowest level, but positions ranging right up to and including manager of the facility. And he tells me that while well, the turnover rate for able-bodied employees is 14 months, which is why, think about it for a moment, when you go to your Tim Hortons restaurant over and you keep going to the same one year after year, you don't see the same staff for very long. There's a reason. The turnover rate is 14 months. 
on average, and it costs $4,000 every time a new employee has to be hired. But the rate for the turnover rate for people with disabilities is seven years. Do the math. And the absenteeism rate is lower than the people with disabilities. And the number of claims, WSIB claims, of the 80 disabled people who uh, have worked there over the 15 years has been zero. Now there's a reason for this. If you're a disabled person like myself who um, uses long leg braces or a cane or a scooter to get around or, or some other device, and you see something on the upper shelf, the one thing you don't do is get a swivel chair and say, I'll get it for you. <laughs> it, it turns out that's an able-bodied response. <laughs> And so, as a result, um, you see what happens. Those are some of the statistics. That's from a Tim Hortons outlet. But as the different studies have shown, both the Deloitte uh, white paper on disabilities and the Compass Research paper, and then the federal panel report, simply put, disabled people make great employees. And in terms of Mark Wafer, his stores happen to be amongst the very, very best in all of Canada which is why a number of the other Tim Hortons outlets are copying what he is doing, and which is why Tim Hortons as an institution, as a corporation, uh, is in fact reassessing and redirecting um, their hiring programs. I give these speeches and I quote these statistics and I give these examples because I want people to become familiar with the single reason to hire people with disabilities. I like to remind potential employers that when you do this, you will probably feel good. You've done the right thing. Um, your family will think better of you in all likelihood. Uh, a charitable organization recognizing what you've accomplished may in fact give you an award. And in each of the examples I've just cited here, I can tell you that I know people who these things have actually happened to. But there's only one real reason. And it is this, it makes good business sense. You don't have to hire the person because it's the right thing to do. You don't have to hire the person because it makes you feel good and you don't have to hire the person because uh, you're gonna receive some sort of recognition. You hire the person for the same reason that Mark Wafer hires them and why he's bumping up from 15% of his workforce to over 20% of his workforce. You do that to make more money because it's profitable. That's the reason to hire people with disabilities. There's a myth out there today that there's a labor shortage in Ontario and a labor shortage in Canada, to which I say, nonsense. There is no labor shortage per se. There are, however, 795,000 adult Canadians who are able to work, who want to work, but can't get jobs. And because of that, they're living on government assistance typically at the rate of $14,000 a year, meaning a life of poverty. Virtually every single person in this room is a taxpayer, and we are paying for those people to remain in poverty. Well, other people turn around and say, there's a labor shortage. Of the 795,000, 340,000 are recent college university graduates, and they can't work, because they're, they're not hired. They're able to work, they're trained to work, they have college diplomas, they have university degrees, and they're sitting at home, right now, at home, on government assistance, being kept there with our money, quite frankly. Government is slowly beginning to recognize this. The Francis Lank and Munir Sheikh report on social services for the province of Ontario recognizes, as do we all, the government is effectively tapped out at all levels and that it's increasingly difficult to continue these payment programs, that there is only one solution, and that is to get the people who want to work, are able to work, who are better profit centers, if you will, and get them hired. The process, though, requires education, such as speeches like this one, and it requires studies, such as the one that uh, Ken Fredine uh, led on behalf of the federal government, it requires other studies. It requires initiatives such as those being undertaken by OCAD University in terms of assessing the whole complex area of disabilities. But it takes, first and foremost, people like yourselves who are in a position to hire and are willing to learn more 
of how to do it and what it will mean for your company. In countless speeches over the years, I've given the following example. Supposing after today's lunch that you have to go to, you go back to work and your boss has given you a very unusual assignment. You're to interview four people for a position. Um, there's a restriction on the process though, and that is that you can't ask who they are, can't identify them, and you can only see them from the waist down. And so if you interviewed the per first person and rejected hiring him for your company only because he had an artificial leg, you might have missed hiring Terry Fox. If you rejected hiring the man in the wheelchair only because he was in a wheelchair, you might have missed hiring Rick Hansen. If you rejected hiring the woman in the racing wheelchair, who by the way was fluently bilingual, you might have missed hiring the greatest Paralympian athlete Canada has ever produced, Chantal Petitclair. If you did not hire the man in the power wheelchair who could not speak for himself and thus depended on a computer voice box to answer his questions and did not hire him only because of those reasons, then you may not have hired the person considered to be today on the planet Earth the most intelligent person of all, Dr. Stephen Hawking. And then you could go back to your boss. And then you could try to explain why you didn't hire Terry Fox, Rick Hansen, Chantel Petitclair, or Dr. Stephen Hawking. And then you could collect your own pink slip. <laughs> 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 and you could try to understand maybe your own negotiating skills weren't the best, and maybe you'd need to brush up on your own job skills. Now, those are fictional examples, and yet I can tell you that every single day in this country, a range of disabled people get rejected because of that first impression. And I like to tell people and ask them, when you meet someone with a disability for the first time, what is it that you see? Do you see the disability or do you see the ability within? And we all like to say, no, I don't see the disability, I see the ability within. We like to say it because it makes us feel good, it's a warm answer, and we think it's probably the answer the questioner wants us to give. And we all know it's not true. We all see the disability. And there's nothing wrong with that, as long as we don't allow that first impression to be a value judgment on the potential of that person. You know, there was a time in this country, and it wasn't that long ago, that women could not vote. There was a time when women were not in any position of managerial or executive responsibility. I thought of this yesterday when I read the headline that General Motors' new CEO is a woman and that her creative design awareness has led to a, a tremendous rejuvena rejuvenation of uh, General Motors' uh, traditionally stayed designs. But there was a time when women were kept in clerical positions. And then somebody said, this is wrong was a man, actually. Many women did say it, but someone in executive position said, this is wrong. And he didn't do a study, and he didn't do a survey, he did not create a focus group, he started to hire and started to move women up the ladder. There was a day in this country when people of color had no position of responsibility in the boardrooms or in the executive decision-making halls until somebody said, this is wrong. And they didn't do a survey, and they didn't do a, survey, a study, and they didn't convene a focus group. What they started to do was look for, reach out, and find the most qualified person who happened to be of color. Now the same can apply to virtually every other minority group that has struggled for rights in our society over the last number of years. We could refer to areas of sexual orientation, of other ethnic groups, of aboriginals. At some point, each and every one of these groups was met by a decision maker who said, this is wrong. And they didn't do a focus group, they didn't do a study, they didn't do a survey, they simply started to hire based on ability. Well, there's one and only one group left. And the part of the problem, the biggest part of the problem is our definitions 
we refer in all of our attitudes to re related to minority groups as women, ethnic, immigrants, aboriginals, LGBT, and the disabled. Well, there is no the disabled. There's men and women who are able-bodied or disabled. There are black people who are able-bodied and blacks who are disabled. There are aboriginals who are able-bodied and disabled. There are gay men and women who are able and disabled. We are us. We are them. There is no them. They, there is no they. It's all us. So as we look to the future, uh, we as a society have a real choice to make. There, there's a crossroads, I believe. The minority group of disabled people, and we are the largest minority in our culture, 15.5% are disabled in today's Ontario, half of whom have invisible disabilities. The other half have visible disabilities, and it's a significant statistic. But when we take into account the immediate family members of those people, us, what is the percentage? It's over 53% of our entire population. If I ask for a show of hands right now as to which person's had a disability, either visible or invisible, or have a family member, an immediate family member, more than half would put their hands in the air. That's the Ontario we live in today, and yet that unemployment rate is still the nut that has to be cracked. And I tell you today, I do not believe that economic recovery, full economic recovery, is possible in Canada or Ontario until and unless that issue is finally addressed. So those have been the themes that I have been working on as Lieutenant Governor over the last six years. And as my term comes to an end, I know that I'm going to be moving into the business world, I'm going to be moving into academia. I don't know exactly where, exactly what, those decisions haven't been made. But uh, I would just leave you with the message that I brought here today and ask you to examine what is going on in your company. Do you have 15% of your workforce with disabled people? If you don't, you're not making enough money. You're missing out on profits. And that's enough of a reason, I would suggest, whether you're reporting to the board, the treasurer, or if you're the CEO wanting to talk to your treasurer or your head of HR, wondering why you're not at the 15% mark, uh, things can change and will change for the better. For both Ruth Ann and myself, it has been an absolute honor over the past six years to be in this position. It is, sorry. It has been a, a real pleasure to speak to so many of you uh, over the years because many of you have been at other audiences where I've uh, attended. And I know that great progress has been made in so many different directions related to accessibility. We are so much further ahead uh, than we were six years ago, still a way to go. But in the meantime, I would like to take this opportunity to wish you all a very, very Merry Christmas, a very Happy New Year. I hope. Most, if not all of you, will be able to attend the New Year's Day levy at Queen's Park uh, on January 1st, 12 noon, uh, and be able to uh, meet uh, personally at that time. In the meantime, in the name of the Queen, and on behalf of the people of Ontario, I wish you all a very Merry Christmas, a very Happy New Year, and thank you to the Empire Club for inviting me to return to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your remarks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have a, a quick presentation uh, for someone that is uh, a recipient of this year's uh, Community Service Award. In 2000, the club, uh, uh, the Empire Club of Canada established this Community Service Award. The purpose of this award is to recognize an individual who gives their time, talent, and treasure selflessly to people in need. This individual reaches out to those who are neglected, sometimes forgotten, in order to make uh, our society better. 
They do this work and seek no recognition. And over the years, we have recognized a variety of outstanding and generous people. This year's recipient is Mr. Raj Kothar. Raj came to Canada through the United Kingdom and India. He and his wife and daughters arrived in 1988. He obtained his chartered accountancy uh, uh, accreditation in the UK and then joined Coopers and Librand, a predecessor firm of the firm of which he's now managing partner, PwC. Since his arrival, uh, Raj has always searched for ways in which he can, he can improve the lives of individuals and the society in which, he leaves, in which he lives. He participates in a number of community organizations that meet a variety of needs, whether it's the arts, uh, children, youth, education, Raj is there. Um, I've got a list of about four pages of various things that he's done, and I'm going to save you from reciting all of them, but some of the notable ones on this list are the Indo-Canadian Chamber of Commerce, the Stratford Festival, um, the Duke of Edinburgh Award, Harvard Business School, Lester B. Pearson College, the Toronto General Western Hospital Foundation, of which I think you're the finance chair, um, the school, Schulich School of Business and the Toronto Board of Trade. Raj has been there uh, for so many different organizations and for so many people over the years. And he's someone that is new to our society. He only arrived in 1988. Raj is someone that is indicative of the type of people we are uh, and someone that has risen to the very top of his profession. And now uh, we we're very pleased to offer him this, this award and to recognize your efforts, Raj. Would you please come? Uh, to the podium. Thank you. I'd like to call upon MJ Perry to give the official appreciation to his honor. With your indulgence, your honor, I would like to take two seconds to thank your aide de camp, who um, told me when I was wrong so gently that I didn't realize I was being told I was wrong. So thank you very much for all your assistance. <laughs> Um, we are very grateful for the relationship we have had with both your honours. I personally love sitting beside um, Mrs. Only every time we get together. We appreciate your words of inspiration and the fact that we can learn that by doing what is right, we can profit in many ways. And that was indeed a heartwarming message. Thank you for your coming with, to us so often. Thank you for your words. Thank you. Thank you. A final note of thanks uh, to Spencer Stewart for sponsoring our event this afternoon and for Mr. Discount for sponsoring our student table. I'd like to thank Nat, the National Post, our print media sponsor, and Ben Balkenberg for providing our AV. This meeting will be carried and aired on Rogers TV, and we're grateful for your ongoing support as well. We're on Twitter and on Facebook, and we have a website, empireclub.org. If you're interested in membership information, uh, you can find it there. Thank you all for coming. Merry Christmas to all of you, and we hope to see you again soon. This meeting of the Empire Club of Canada is now adjourned.